everyone for being here. As the first talk, you always wonder, am I going to be speaking to an empty room or not? And thank you to the organizers of Nordic Design, as well as all of the other fabulous speakers. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. So now, before I launch into my keynote, I want to take a moment. I want to take a moment and try to slow us down a little bit, to feel our bodies, our voices, our collective minds in action. So I want to ask everybody to stand up for a second. I'd like to ask you to stand up. Stand up, and if you have space, stretch out your arms. Stretch them wide. If you feel like it, you can close your eyes. You can close your eyes and feel your body. Feel every part of your body. Are there parts of it that hurt? Are there parts of it that are sore? Now, what I want to try together is simply a moment together, the gift of time. I'd like for us to count together as a group to 60. It sounds like a long time. It's probably longer than you've been off of your phone in a while. <laughs> but I think it's a moment to hear your own voice but also to hear the people around you. So if you like, close your eyes, and we'll start counting together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. Thank you. So today, I want to tell you some ideas I have about design. But I think that it's really important to know where somebody is coming from before you listen to what they have to say. And so I want to start with a personal anecdote, my own subjectivity. So my parents were immigrants to the United States from India. They came there with strict principles and big aspirations. My mother was a programmer who became a roboticist. My father was a chemical engineer who landed in management. Now, because of my mom's robotics background, our favorite movie when we were a kid was Short Circuit, about a robot who is struck by lightning and gains consciousness. Now, the standard joke in my family was that I was actually a robot, but my mom had just forgotten to, turn, uh, to, to add an off switch. So my parents, they wanted me to be an engineer or a scientist. I resisted this to study art, which they didn't like at all. But along the way, I found graphic design, which seemed like something to suit the situation. It was creative, it was artistic, but it was also applied. 
My parents didn't even know what graphic design was, but at least they thought, well, he can make a living doing that. And I think that this is really interesting about graphic design, that it is a compromise sometimes. I'll say more about that. I remember when the first graphic design studio that I founded came to, the came to the White House in Washington, D.C., because we had won the National Design Award for Communication Design. We had the privilege of listening to a speech from First Lady Michelle Obama about design, and she said, design is art plus science. Now, I don't exactly use those same words, but I think that she captured something important. Design is an in-between, it's an intersection, it does represent a compromise, and in my case, it was a sense of responsibility to my parents and to something outside of my own artistic desires. Now, the Eames office had a much more interesting way of putting it. In this famous diagram, they said that the designer's work is at the intersection of the interests of the designer, the area of interest of the client, and the concerns of society as a whole. Importantly, they note that these areas aren't static, that they all influence each other. So my talk today is about the hows of design. It's named in homage to the best-selling radical book, Ways of Seeing. This book was a way of looking at Western art history in a new way, thinking about the political and economic imperatives that drove it, trying to unmask its ideologies. It changed my way of thinking and looking when I first read it. But it was focused primarily on a critical way of looking at art. I want to talk today about a way of making design. I would argue that today, nearly everybody, even if they don't call themselves a designer, is a designer. And that's because anytime you make a social media post, you're combining text and image to create meaning. And even if you don't own the tools or the final image, you're still participating in graphic design. Today, we're facing unprecedented environmental, political, and social challenges. We live in a world on the cusp of cataclysmic transformations. Graphic design is a very small field. It's a humble field. But I'd like to talk about the roles that it might play in creating some kind of better future. How can we create graphic design with a sense of ethical responsibility? How can design help move us from narrow, commercially driven individual parameters to something that might be more collective? So today I'm going to talk about three qualities that guide my work and thinking around graph design. I hope that they'll make a starting point for a discussion. The first is what I call bumpiness. Bumpiness is a term I often use to characterize an approach to design, curating, art making, or more that's self-reflexive, that makes you aware of how a thing is made, that challenges easy consumption. Today's world is geared more and more towards smoothness of interfaces, of spaces, of experiences in general. I would argue that this is because the economic, political, and social systems of our times try to increase consumption. Removing friction and discomfort from the process of consumption is a good way to enhance this. I'm often inspired by the writer and critic Sarah Ahmed and her essay, A Phenomenology of Whiteness. She looks at the experience of people of color in a context in which whiteness is taken as a neutral condition. She strikes a note of potential positivity. For her, discomfort, becoming unseated, can be productive. It can open up new worlds of experience. This is a kind of bumpiness. It's a value to discomfort. On a more micro level, somebody who really inspires me is the type designer Fred Smyers. In his book, Counterpunch, he wrote a revisionist history of Renaissance typography. One of his main arguments is that the irregularity of early letterpress printing is what made it legible. That, in fact, uniform typography, uniform surfaces are boring, and that irregularity on a micro level can actually help to take in complex ideas. I think this is an important one, slowing down in order to comprehend better. 
So the second quality I want to discuss today is juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is about difference between multiple parts of a set and how such differences can provide aesthetic, operational, and even ethical advantages. Our experience of the contemporary world is based increasingly on sameness. Our filters, our feeds, they pay attention to what we respond well to and give us more of that. We start to see news items just like those we've liked. We're fed streams of songs that are familiar to those we've already listened to. As we know, this approach is not random. It's driven by algorithms and is an increasingly predictive way to understand our behaviors, model them, and feed them back to us in a seamless, smooth manner. Now, I think that there are lots of interesting research studies, for example, by Columbia University's Center for Spatial Research, that look at how mid-century American urban planning actually created and perpetuated racism by thinking that people who were different from each other didn't want to live next to each other. This is clearly at work in social media as well. Just the assumption that because you're different from someone, you don't want to hear what they have to say. You don't want to hear or look at their newsfeed. It goes without saying, but I'll say it here. The largest scale catastrophe is still in front of us in the form of climate crisis and the collapse of our ecological systems. In this world, which may be changed beyond what we can recognize today, I believe what will be valuable won't be the ability to react to stimuli that we already know, to surround ourselves with people and things and ideas that are like us, but rather the ability to acknowledge, understand, and learn from that which is unfamiliar and radically different. The science fiction writer Octavia Butler uh, wrote a phenomenal uh, novel that I recommend you all read called The Parable of the Sower. It takes place in 2027 in a world that has changed just enough. The book's protagonist, Lauren Olamina, knows from the start that the gated walls of her Los Angeles community will not be able to stave off the urban poor, the dispossessed, those without water or money or food. As she learns, in order to survive in this transformed world, the group that she gathers around her must embrace diversity or be destroyed. In a more positive mode, I know it is only 10 o'clock in the morning, I want to point to the fact that embracing difference represents a potential mode of personal and spiritual growth. Rather than looking for things that confirm what we know already, Juxtaposition is trying to understand things that are outside of our understanding and criteria that challenge our existing ideas. The third principle I want to talk about today is generosity. Generosity is something we learn in the most basic form as children, to share with others, to give reciprocally. Yet we live in an era of unprecedented and ever-growing individuality. Fifty years ago, we had many images of a collective world, of humans living with each other. But the most resonant social symbol of our times are headphones, which unite people across continents and contexts in a common retreat into individual personal spheres, even when you're physically together. This is one of the things coupled with the larger structural effects of capitalism and colonialism that have led us to the traumatic and decisive moment in which we find ourselves. I am inspired by novelist Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. He tries to diagnose this illness in literature and beyond. He looks at why European and North American literature of the last 50 years has created so few works that look at climate change and catastrophe. And he finds that literature has been too concerned with the, quote, individual moral journey to examine collective problems. This could be applied to other artistic and creative fields as well. I believe that graphic design can be a generous discipline. Its basis is in communication the mediating of different positions, the transfer of knowledge or feeling between different people or things. 
It is, as I've suggested before, interdependent. It never exists in a vacuum, but it's always in dialogue. It's also collaborative. No piece of graphic design, even the most independent seeming, is made by a lone person. The best pronoun for graphic design is we. This mutuality, this reciprocality, means that graphic design can give more than it takes. It can be a gift that moves in both directions. Now, I want to look at a handful of recent works of graphic design that exhibit some of the qualities I've outlined. Bumpiness, juxtaposition, and generosity. Some of these are projects by my own graphic design studio, workshops, and others are by other colleagues of ours. I'll start at a small scale and grow from there. The first is I want to zoom in on the primary typeface of this very presentation, the typeface Minotaur by Jean-Baptiste Levey. At reading or even moderately large sizes, it seems a little bit awkward, but otherwise quite normal looking as a serif typeface. But if you blow it up to a large scale, it shows something else. It's a digital typeface with faceted cuts. It's a typeface whose construction is unavoidable that makes you think about how it's made. It is, quite literally, bumpy. On a larger scale, we could look at a project that is dear to my heart. This is the identity system that workshops created for SALT, an experimental and progressive art museum in Istanbul. Instead of creating a static branding system, we treated the institution's uh, custom typeface as a curatorial program. Every three to six months since 2010, the institution invites a different designer to create a new set of the letters S-A-L-T, which is then used on every medium from print to web to signage. The project itself builds a virtual community a group of designers dispersed in space but juxtaposed through this institution and project. At the same time, the project tried to model a kind of generosity. The, the institution was funded by the second largest bank in Istanbul, and so we, as the designers of the system, could take some of the funding and redistribute it to other colleagues of ours emerging in different parts of the world. Thinking about how design can create playing fields and spaces for other people to act in reminds me of the work of my colleagues, the Rodina, Czech designers based in Amsterdam. Over the past several years, they've developed an approach to graph design that combines performance, digital image making, programming, and virtual reality. <laughs> This is a bumper for an exhibition that they did the identity for, called States of Play. But the important thing is that to create the identity, they created a virtual world that people could play in and could experience the graph design in time. Sometimes a project can play at all of these levels and in multiple roles. Here I want to point to the inaugural Fikra Graph Design Biennial. It took place in Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates. Sharjah is just a stone's throw away from Dubai, but it's a very different context. It's less economically powerful than Dubai, but it's a center of culture, with a book fair, a world-famous art biennial, and a new architectural triennial opening next month. I had the privilege to help initiate, artistic direct, and design the first Fikra Graph Design Biennial. It was a month-long exhibition and festival with an accompanying educational program. It served as the first graph design biennial in the Middle East, North Africa region. So as you can see here, it took place within five stories of the former Bank of Sharjah building, which was repurposed for this, uh, for this show. And the show focused on experimental, interdisciplinary, and socially engaged practices that pushed the boundaries of graph design. In particular, it seemed very significant to have this approach because the overall field of graph design in Dubai and the Emirates is very smooth. It's focused on commerce. 
Before I get into the details, I'm going to play a quick video of the exhibition's opening night, which gives you a little bit of an overview. Morreu na contramão, atrapalhando o Maybe by the end of today, we'll all be dancing. Well, one thing that's important to say, it was a major team effort. I was originally invited to curate the project, but I knew that I needed collaborators. I couldn't do it alone. So I invited designer and educator Emily Smith, based in Berlin, and designer and artist Na Kim, based in Seoul, South Korea, to join me as co-artistic directors. I knew that their perspective would give me something that was outside of my experience. The design studio workshops, my studio, led by my partner Chris Wu, created the graph design and identity. Now, the process of discovery allowed us to ask questions of FICRA, the organization who organized the biennial. And we came up with the core idea for a ministry of graphic design, an exhibition that takes the form of a fictional governmental ministry. The United Arab Emirates has many future-looking governmental departments, from the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence or the Minister of State for Happiness. And we modeled it on this, but with a twist. We asked, what if an experimental graphic design exhibition were reframed as a fiction? We thought it might go against the expectations of a biennial. It might be bumpy enough to slow people down, take notice, and think about the exhibition and its approach more closely. Our next decision was to structure the show as an exhibition of exhibitions. Instead of privileging one approach and one voice, we founded five different departments, each with very quirky names, like the Department of Graphic Optimism, or the Department of Flying Saucers, or the Department of Non-Binaries. Each of these departments had a department head, a, curated, a curator whom we appointed, and who then developed their own independent curatorial and spatial approach. The show ended up including over 40 participants from 20 nationalities, spanning many graphic designers who were going outside of the established graphic design scene. But this was only possible because our curatorial team came from such different backgrounds and specialities. It meant that they didn't represent a single homogenous geographic or cultural background, but they approached the field of graphic design with a diverse and set of complementary ideas. So this is juxtaposition. This is bringing together people who are very different to make something that is even better than it could be made by a smaller group or a more homogenous group. I want to talk briefly about a couple of the projects in it. I'll start with the German duo Knot and Renner's interactive app and website, Common Canvas. Common Canvas allowed students from design schools all over the world, including Korea, Brazil, Egypt, and beyond, to respond to urgent questions of our time in a graphic way, which were then automatically uploaded into an interface and visible for all the people at the exhibition. On the other hand, there were projects that highlighted the role of the designer in creating platforms. The Turkish designer, graphic designer, Esen Karol, who has been a significant practitioner and teacher in Turkey over the last 25 years. Since 2010, she's held talks by artists, academics, architects, and others in her studio, and she calls them Jeff Talks, after the ubiquitous IKEA chair. For each lecture, she commissions a different emerging Turkish or international designer to create an offset printed poster, and we showcase these. The third project that I'll highlight is an entire section of the exhibition, actually. It was the largest show within a show, the Department of Non-Binaries. 
curated by Brazil-based design and research practice, Common Interest. This group is headed by Nina Paim, a Brazilian-born designer and researcher, and Corinne Giselle, a Swiss-born designer. They focus on social and political questions in design. The Department of Non-Binaries as a show focused on hybrid and interdisciplinary practices, particularly those that intersected with timely topics like nationalism, migration, gender and sexual discrimination, labor exploitation, and more. Particularly in the context of the United Arab Emirates, these are hot and very controversial topics, but graphic design as a discipline in between could already be a Trojan horse, a way to talk about some of these ideas in a way that would be palatable and would be able to start a dialogue. Common Interest actually won the Swiss Design Award for this show, which was incredible for us to be able to have, create a platform for them. Oop, what just happened? Hello, this is Bumpy. <laughs> so, what I was saying was that the, one of the things that is most gratifying about the project, but also part of its generosity, we're all good, is that it tried to make its topics available to wide publics. It tried to be generous in how it put things into the world. And it received a ton of press, both in general and in more specialist uh, outlets. But this is important for us to talk about. I think that graph design can be generous when it teaches other people about itself. One thing I know is that maybe after a show like this, my parents would know what graph design is. That would be good in itself. <laughs> So that was, sorry, this is, that was just a snapshot of one month of activities in the FICRA Graph Design Biennial and all of the kind of educational programs and workshops that happened. I want to end this section with my own everyday attempts at giving away knowledge. I believe that graph design can be a generous discipline when it makes its tools available to others. In this spirit, I've been publishing since 2016 an ever-changing ebook called P exclamation mark DF. It's something between a memoir, a monograph, a manifesto, and a manual. Someone once called it a novel in keynote form, which is my favorite description of it so far, but I think about it as a way to both embody and explain the principles that I think about. What binds together all of these last examples is, of course, teaching. Graph design should make its skills and its techniques open and available to all. I think it's amazing that we're all here today for Nordic design, but we're also very privileged to be here in this room listening to this. So I want us to ask, how can we make our skills more widely available? How can we bring our expertise to other people who need graph design and its knowledge but might not have access to it? So, I believe that the true power of graph design is not its ability to persuade, to seduce, to convince, to sell, but it's in its ability to listen, to learn, to reflect, and to give. It can give back more than it takes. I also think that graph design is modest. It has interdependence, and it has mutuality. I'm gonna have to skip over this because I'm out of time already, but I wanna point us all to the novel Oval by Elvia Wilk. It actually represents a kind of dystopia where generosity in the form of a drug that makes people more generous goes horribly awry. Graph design is not a magic pill. It's not going to change the world all on its own. But I think that if we change our behaviors, we can start to think about how we can change the world around us. So I want to suggest that these new criteria of bumpy, juxtaposition and generous can help us to think about graph design and how it works, both when we make it and when we look at it. 
So I'm gonna leave us all with a final question. I want you all to take a moment and close your eyes again. I'm gonna ask you a question, I want you to write down the answer for yourself when you're done, on your phone, notebook, or whatever you have. The question is, how could you work to make design a more generous discipline? How could you work to make design a more generous discipline? Write down your answer for yourself, and I'll ask you one last thing. In the course of today, seek out somebody whom you don't know here in this audience and talk about your answers with each other. Thank you very much.